Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Alabama a and University Small Farms Research Center Outreach Program. Today, we have a special guest. We actually have three special guests. Ms. Holly Lynn Killings from Jefferson County Conservation District, Ms. Gina Harris with USDA Farm Service Agency, and Mr. Alandis Curry with Jefferson County NRC District Conservationists. Welcome, you all. You're on mute. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning, everyone. So uh, we were gonna actually go ahead and begin. Welcome to our guests. Please note that if you haven't registered or uh, signed on to our Facebook page, uh, Small Farms Research Center, AAMU, this broadcast would be live as well as it would be on our YouTube channel by this afternoon. So please feel free to uh, share and like and for it as well. So. I will pass the torch to Mr. Curry. Welcome. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hope all is well. Um, actually, you guys are going uh, to hear from me a little bit uh, later. I'm going to let Holly go ahead and start off with the uh, presentation. Then we're going to go to uh, Farm Service Agency uh, with Miss uh, Gina Harris. Then you all will hear from me uh, a little bit later. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining in. And uh, any questions or any statements, um, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, send in a message or whatever, and we're going to do our best uh, to make sure that we answer your questions. Thanks again. Thank you, Olandis. Okay, welcome everyone again. Uh, we always like to do a little bit of a history lesson before we start out with outreach, just in case you didn't know um, how NRCS and the Conservation District got started. So if, you, if we remember from history, back when the Dust Bowl started, that was about the 1930s, 1920s, uh, we had a huge issue with erosion and all of that kind of, all of that that went with it. We were having problems farming. So along came a man named Hugh Hammond Bennett, who we now call the father of soil conservation. And he was able to kind of study what was going on, figure out how to fix it, and we pretty much owe him all our soil conservation practices and uh, and for what he did. Um, there's a lot. There's a really neat PBS uh, video. I think it is on YouTube. You could watch all about him. I could go on for days probably, but we'll just hit the highlights. But back basically, um, after all that, in 1934, it was like 83 percent of Alabama land was damaged due to erosion. So. They realized they had to do something. They had to make soil conservation a top priority. So they made uh, the first conservation district, which was in North Carolina. And now we have over about 3,000 local conservation districts over the US. And we're lucky to have one in every county in Alabama. So, and you can find your local district um, online on our website, or, but we're here in Jefferson. And uh, Alandis is our district conservationist, and he covers Jefferson and St. Clair counties. Um, back in the day, what mainly what a district was is they were the local connection. They had, you know, the government agents who, through Mr. Bennett's uh, guidance and and uh, wisdom, would show farmers how to uh, better have conservation practices so that they could save their soil and grow what we needed back then but they realized they needed that local connection. So that's kind of where the conservation district came into play. So we have a five member volunteer board. They all volunteer their time to help guide and uh, decide the local conservation priorities. So that was kind of the basic standing point. But now of course we've all evolved um, coming into the, the, 20, you know, the 21st century. We do a lot of more stuff other than just that. We also educate our local uh, community um, local farmers. We also educate young students. So today, in addition to all of that stuff and working with NRCS and being their local partner, we also educate just for our county, we do um, a yearly water festival for fourth graders, urban forestry and conservation fair for fifth graders. And we also have poster and photo contest and anti-litter video competition that just wrapped up. 
and as, as well as some other um, yearly activities. But you can find all that information on our website and our social media stuff. We do have um, probably a photo contest next month coming up, so be sure to look out for that. And you can find a lot of information on all that stuff um, on our website. I encourage you to visit there later. And again, we do have a newsletter that I do every quarter. So if you wanna sign up for that, you can just scan the QR code right there with your camera. I'll leave that up for just a second before I didn't wanna forget about that later. So if you wanna sign up for that, we'll have one coming out in June. We uh, talk about uh, upcoming events and things like that. And we're also on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok if you're into any of those things. And here's our website address as well. And now, um, before, of course, before you work with NRCS or while you're working with NRCS, not really before they work simultaneously together, is uh, FSA. You have to do a, a couple things with them as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Gina and she's going to talk about and as well as some programs that she offers. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, so Farm Service Agency is the keeper of the farm records, if you will. So if you need a farm or track number, um, you'll initiate that with our office. Also, um, we take the payment eligibility forms for Farm Service Agency and for Natural Resources Conservation Service. So we work uh, together with them. They are our technical advisor for many of our programs. So if you, the first step would, if you, if you don't have a farm and track number, would be to get a farm and track number and we would help you get your payment eligibility forms in order so you would be eligible to participate in one of our programs or one of NRCS's programs, and sometimes even what the Soil and Water Conservation District offers. Some of the programs that Farm Service Agency offers, we have some conservation programs, we have disaster programs, we sometimes have safety net programs, and some of those, so some of the conservation programs include the Conservation Reserve Program, we have um, ongoing until next Friday, the Conservation Reserve Program Grasslands, which is a working lands program. That means you can actually get a rental payment from the government. It's a small payment, but you can get a rental payment from the government and still be able to use your land for uh, grazing or hay. We also have the Emergency Forest Restoration Program, and that actually is active right now through tomorrow in Jefferson County because of the tornadoes that we, um, experienced back a couple of months ago. We also have the emergency conservation program. All of those programs um, are considered conservation programs because they're, they're gonna try to keep soil from eroding, keep water quality, those kind of things. We have some disaster programs. The non-insured disaster assistance program, that's NAP. That is basically crop insurance for non-insurable crops. So, so not commodity crops, but generally like fruits and vegetables or grasses. We have a livestock forage program that kicks in um, automatically with a little bit of little bit of effort on our part, but that is generated when there's a severe drought. Um, there's an emergency livestock assistance program. There's several, several programs. All of those are generated um, when there's a disaster. All of our disasters have to be a natural disaster. It has to be a weather event that caused it. And then we have some safety net programs. Those are for the market conditions and stuff. So we have like marketing assistance loans, loan deficiency payments. These come into play when, uh, when the market for a commodity is severely low. Um, so like, again, just to reiterate, the first thing you'd want to do if you're wanting to participate with our office or with Natural Resources Conservation Service would be to get a farm and track and to get your payment eligibility forms. And that's where we, um, that's the first step. You can um, access our office by telephone, by email. Um, you can go to farmers.gov, the website's on one of these slides, and you can go there and you can eventually click down until you get to um, Alabama. And we, um, our office actually serves, we're located in Oneonta. We serve Blount County, Walker County, and Jefferson County. And we'd be happy to assist any of you. We also have farm storage facility loans that does include hay barns. And we have, um, we offer ownership loans and farm operating loans. Operating loans would be if you want them to buy livestock or you need to get equipment or you just need enough money to put your crop in the ground. And then of course, ownership loans could or 
uh, could include a home, does not have to. It would be a land purchase. But um, those are what we offer and we are here and we look forward to working with any of you and we'll, we'll do our best to help you. Don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you for your time. And I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Alandis. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Holly. Uh, good morning again. My name is Alandis Curry. Uh, and we're going to discuss some uh, things that we have going on with NRCS. Uh, I'm going to start off a little bit just talking about uh, the basics of, inter, uh, of the NRCS. Uh, as Holly stated earlier, uh, if we were, you know, really going in depth about our programs and, you know, about in and the, and the terms of the things that we do, um, we will be on here for uh, a length, uh, a great length of time. So just a little bit about NRCS and what we do. Uh, NRCS, um, we are a technical agency. Um, I always tell my landowners, one of the first thing uh, when I go out to the field or I receive a phone call, uh, I let them know that, you know, we're non-regulatory. And I know that's a question that we get uh, from a lot of people. Uh, we are a volunteer uh, service uh, through uh through the USDA. So everything that we do, if you know, if we knock, we're not going to be knocking on your doors, you know, we're not regulatory. So if you come and work with us, it's all on your own. Uh, and, you know, just based upon what you heard from other farmers or what you hear from outreach. Uh, so just a little thing about us. Um, our main focus is we work with resource concerns. Uh, henceforth, uh, the first two, um, uh, words, natural resources. So that entails soil, water, plants, air, and animals. Um, and also uh, in some of the handbooks, you have uh, people and also energy as well. Uh, we assist landowners in installing conservation practices that will improve working agricultural lands. Uh, farmers and ranchers, local and state governments, and other federal agencies to maintain healthy and productive uh, landscapes. I um, always tell people that if you work with NRCS, uh, we want to make sure that uh, after a year or six months, two years of working with us, uh, our main objective is to make sure that we leave those lands in uh, better shape than uh, what we found them. So that's the main objective. So what's the process? Uh, how do you get started? These are questions we hear all the time. Uh, you know, people always ask me the questions, okay, what's the minimum acre? Is there a minimum? Um, you know, I have a quarter acre, um, half acre. What can I do? And that's what we're going to really, we're going to dive in that today a little bit, uh, especially with the urban, uh, urban ag initiative. We're going to uh, propose uh, several practices and enhancements uh, that we can actually put on those small parcels. Even though it's small, uh, the return is going to be mighty uh, if done correctly. Uh, so just the NRCS uh, process, uh, you kind of have two of the same right here, uh, but it all starts off with a site visit, um, an application, and upon that site visit, uh, that's when we're going to look at some of the land suitability. Uh, you know, for instance, I give you an example. If you say, you state that you're interested in a seasonal high tunnel, uh, some of the basic prelim that we're going to, uh, that we're going to be looking for is, okay, um, the, the specs call for zero to two percent uh, grade on putting the high tunnel down. So if I come out there, conservation district come out there or a technician soil con, and if we see that you're on a five or 6% slope, um, that, that could be an issue. So what we're going to do, we're going to, you know, try to see if we can find some elk, some um, locations that we can actually meet that uh, zero to 2% uh, grade. Um, if you're interested from there, and that's just a small portion, we're going to ask for um, soil tests, Make sure that you know whatever you're going to put in the ground. We need to make sure that the soils is uh, conducive to producing the crop that uh, you want to generate. Number two, we start off with an application. Uh, once you get your application, uh, you know if, if then we're going to go through the ranking process. And if you rank high enough, uh, we're going to go through a pr uh, approval. Then we're going to go through the commencement, the commencing of the practice, the inspection. Uh, then if it meets NRCS standards and specifications. Uh, that's when we pay you for that. Okay, so that's just a quick rundown of it. Uh, with within each of those, the approval, the commencement practice. Uh, do know that we will be giving you um, uh, the steps 
whatever you if you're planting something say for instance if you're doing a honeybee a small area honeybee planting uh we're going to tell you the basics if you're doing a honeybee the state of alabama want to say it requires at least a minimum of uh, nine species uh that's going to generate uh, uh specifically within uh early spring <clears throat> excuse me uh, early spring late spring summer and fall so here in Alabama, being a trop, we are pretty tropical. We want to make sure that we have some type of floral florage at least 75 to 80 percent of the time um, with the honeybee pollinator. That's the goal. And also, right here, just broken down more in our CS term, right here, you have the planning. Uh, that's you know that starts with the land visit, uh, site visit, have the application eligibility. Uh, one of the things, as Miss Gina stated earlier, part of the uh, eligibility. Um, with us is the AGI, making sure that you, if, you know, that it asks a question on, do you make more than $900,000 a year? Um, then it's NRCS ranks application, and then the, uh, the approval and the commencement part of it. So there you go. Um, what does cost share, uh, share rate work? How does that work? So I tell people on average, cause this is a question uh, that we get all the time. Uh, understand when working with NRCS, it's good to have an idea in the terms of, you know, you may, you may hear this outreach program and you say, you know what, man, that seasonal high tunnel is a great idea. Uh, the micro irrigation is a, it's a great idea. But I always tell people, when you want to put conservation on the ground, uh, it needs to be an investment. It is an investment that's on your behalf. So even though I have 70, 85%, if it's an investment, if you're going to get 50%, if you're going to get 40%, and if it's something that you want to do, I kind of look at it like this. It's, it's going to assist you in, uh, you know, moving conservation forward uh, for your business, for your operation, for your nonprofit, whatever it is for. Uh, I think, you know, whatever we provide, if you get approved, is to assist you. Uh, sometimes, I guess I could tell you some, some, some cons about it. You hear somebody that got this great idea, but they never consider what they may have to put with it. So I always tell folks, uh, at least give yourself six months to a year or however long to start planning for uh, some of these things. Uh, there's other grants. I'm not gonna discuss them today with other uh, partners. Uh, that's a great possibility that you can work with them in addition to uh, with us. You know, uh, you can't double dip in our programs, but there are other assistance and grants that you can get to help move uh, your farm and operation together. Uh, do the work based on NRCS standards and specifications. That's the big thing. Uh, whenever I'm going out to the field, uh, you know, I don't want anybody to get it uh, misunderstood. Uh, we provide cost sharing. We provide technical assistance. But this is the biggest part to it right here. Specifications and hands-on guidance. Uh, making sure that you're doing it right because it's your taxpayer money. Uh, it's my taxpayer money. Even though I work for the government, I, I, I pay taxes. We all pay taxes for the most part. Uh, so we're going to make sure that before we pay for anything, that we're going to give you, you know, the standards and specs, and we want you to be successful on that. Okay. Windows are opportunity when it comes with NRCS. So there are more programs, but these are, I call it, uh, uh, um, our, our big programs, I call it. Okay. Uh, it's the CTA. That's just if you don't want to receive. Uh, any cost sharing money, but you just perhaps have some questions. Uh, maybe you want to do the high tunnel on your own or whatever practice. Uh, I can provide you uh, those standards and specs. I can provide those job sheets to you. Uh, engineer uh, and myself, uh, biologists, or whomever uh, with the, within NRCS, we can come out there and just give you good old fashioned uh, technical assistance. Um, free of, free, it's free of charge. Uh, you you know you you pay for this through your taxpayer dollars. Uh, conservation stewardship program. Won't talk a lot about that one today, but it's just what the middle word says right there. Uh, stewardship. These are for folks who have been doing uh, perhaps uh, maybe it could be CRP program or equip things that they've done and they want to go to the next level of conservation. Uh, most of our programs, uh, practices, uh, they are generally a, a, a contract on average. You're looking between one to three years to have everything completed. But uh, the Conservation Stewardship Program runs for uh, five years, okay? And the benefit of that is part of it is, like I said, going to the next level. But just for having your um, <clears throat> land 
in those programs, it pays you just for things that you've done in the past and uh, not necessarily where you get points on that and that can help elevate your ranking score. And, uh, you know, very, very beneficial program. We're growing it here uh, in, in Jefferson and St. Clair. And this is our flagship program right here, that the one that really stands out. This is the one that we're really going to discuss is EQIP, uh, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And out of EQIP, you have a lot of derivatives uh, programs that comes from that. Uh, one of them is the ag program. I mean, is the uh, urban ag. Then you have the high tunnel initiative. Then you have some of the um, other programs that can come out of EQIP. Uh, wetland reserve programs, um, that's if you want to put your land to an easement. And I stated conservation reserve program, that's not our program. Uh, that belongs to GINA, but NRCS assists with the technical assistance behind that. Okay. Okay, here are our traditional practices. Most time you hear, as I kind of stated in the beginning, when you hear about NRCS, these are the practices that you uh, hear about. Uh, you got cross fencing, you got invasive species management, brush management, uh, heavy use area, prescribed grazing, uh, prescribed uh, fire, um, tree planting, uh, 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 stand improvement, prescribed burning, all of those things, those are just a fruit, a few of those, uh, possibility of a well, watering trough. Uh, so that's your traditional farming that you see. But uh, today we're gonna uh, commence and move upon a different type of mindset, still conservation minded, uh, still moving the pendulum forward to make sure that we're helping people uh, help the land. So with that being said, uh, I'm just gonna only speak on the behalf of our Birmingham area, but with this new initiative that we have, uh, we have cities on here. You can kind of see it for yourself. Birmingham, Huntsville, Dothan, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, Mobile. These are the, uh, the I guess they, they pinpoint these as being the inner cities of Alabama. And, uh, you know, I always give this scenario. I work with a partner, speaking of size and how powerful you can be still just in a, a, a smaller area. I work with a guy out of Mississippi. And he was saying that it took him about four or five years to get to this level, had a seasonal high tunnel. And he was producing, uh, what did he tell me, between thirty dollars to $40,000 of okra in a seasonal high tunnel, 2178, 2,178 square feet, uh, decent sized house, your uh, potential uh, backyard, produced thirty dollars to $40,000 on a small scale, uh, you can call it small scale farming, but if you look at the ag stats, um, you know, a lot of farmers is not, you know, making that, uh, you know, a year, you know, so I'm telling people we want you to be um, open minded uh, when it comes to these ideas, just because it's small, uh, small can be mighty, mighty at times. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today, they're not going to necessarily be the biggest, but with the NRCS, this urban initiative, it's about taking the small square footage and utilizing that small space to make something big, okay? So the benefits of a high tunnel, I'm gonna start right here with the high tunnel because uh, this, this one for the urban area has been uh, the biggest one. So one of the benefits is that it extends the growing season, improves plant quality and soil quality. Uh, so that's the great thing about it. Let's just stop right there on soil. I won't break everything down as I'm going through, but if you have more questions, uh, please don't hesitate. When you, have, when you think about soil quality, it's a lot easier to take the minimum 600 square feet to our, our max that we pay for, the 2178, and mitigate those soils, okay? You can mitigate those soils, meaning that if you have to bring dirt in, if you need use manure or whatever it may be, doing cover crops, if you can take that on a small scale, quote unquote small, uh, get those soils right, uh, get them to a level of great production. Um, it's, it's a lot doing that. It's a, it's a lot easier doing that than say, hey, 15, 20, 30, 40 acres. And that, you know, that's the great thing about this uh, high tunnel is that, you know, you can kind of manipulate it and get it to the place that you want, that you want. Uh, reduce nutrient and pesticide transportation. It's right there. It's contained. Improve air quality through and reduce transportation inputs. And it also reduce energy used by providing consumers with a local source of fresh fruit. And that's the segue right there as we're talking about, um, you know, urban, uh, urban ag is that, that we are in parts of Jefferson County 
and other parts of, of the state of Alabama, uh, we have a lot of folks within those food desert areas that don't have uh, that fresh produce. Uh, then in some of the areas that they may have it because of the competition and whatnot, it well less competition. Sometimes the prices are, um, are super, super, super high. But that's one thing we've seen with the push with this urban ag and the uh, seasonal high tunnel initiative as well, is that we ha we're having people who are actually um, putting the fruit out there, they're putting the veggies out there, and they're also teaching and educating the community on how to do a lot of this stuff uh, themselves. What is needed for a successful, uh, su a successful high tone? Uh, generally a flat lot, as I kind of stated in the beginning. Um, I, I got to correct myself on one thing. I said zero to 2%. Per, zero to 2%. Uh, that zero to 2% is for the micro irrigation system. Actually for a high tone, it may be between zero to 3%. I may be off a little bit, but that just came across my mind. So with the benefit of the new urban, um, urban ag, uh, we have one as small as 600 square feet that's in our uh, manual. So most folks who may have a smaller backyard or they can't uh, put, put the uh, big old, the big you know, structure out there, like I said, it's 21, 7, 8, almost 2,200 square feet, nice size home. Some folks' yards are not that big. Uh, so we are allowing the possibility of having the uh, 600 square feet uh, water source, city or whale water, uh, clear trees at least 25 feet from the limb. So that's a liability thing. We don't want anything falling uh, on the seasonal high tunnel. Uh, planting the ground has to come from um, have to come from the uh, the soil profile. Uh, okay, Tra these are other traditional uh, urban conservation practices that sometimes are called supporting practices or things that kind of can stand alone. Uh, we have mulching. Uh, we have the irrigation system, micro irrigation system. And this is the one, excuse me, that needs to be between zero to 2% uh, for the flow of the water. And to your far right hand side, you see a guy and, and a young lady there um, with the plastic culture on there and um, with the vegetation coming up. And one of the advantages of the micro irrigation, uh, kind of talking to some, some folks from a particular institution, um, guy who, who does a lot of them, there are certain things that you can grow better that he was telling me. He was saying the watermelons, uh, the cantaloupes, uh, that way you can kind of control your soil, just kind of similar to the um, uh, to the high tunnel, you know, but you can kind of mitigate the soils a little bit, or if the soil have a hard time uh, staying moist or whatnot, this is a great um, practice that one can use. Uh, cover crops. So you, some, someone may be saying, what's the cover crop? What's the companion crop? When it comes to soil quality, uh, my best scenario, I like to talk about those tillage radishes. We're in the state of Alabama. And one thing that we can suffer with in many parts of the state is that um, uh, compaction. So you get some tillage, tillage radishes in there. You can kind of use that to kind of break up that compaction. But yet it goes so deep in the ground uh, over a period of time, those tillage radishes kind of rots a little bit and it produces organic matter. So most of the things that NRCS come up with, you know, that, 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 that our folks in DC and, and, you know, on state level, uh, most of the time it can serve dual um, uh, purposes. And another thing I forgot to mention, uh, what's the magic behind the seasonal high tunnel? Uh, part of the magic with the seasonal high tunnel, you know, is the plastic that goes on there. It's that polyethylene plastic. I always tell folks is likening to a rainforest, okay? You kind of get that, um, you get that it's, it's, it's a wet type of atmosphere. And with that type of, that, 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 that warm moist, and that really helps invigorate uh, plant growth. It really does. Um, and that can be a disadvantage. This is one thing I tell you, I won't just tell y'all the pros, uh, often folks who have a season high tunnel. And so it could be a, a good amount of uh, a maintenance behind that too, because with that polyethylene particular uh, molecule that they have within that plastic, it actually, helps your um, your weeds to grow too, okay? So, you know, sometimes, you know, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to be in there probably, you know, once a week, maybe twice a week, just depending on uh, the temperature of that, uh, the high tone, okay? And one of the ways we kind of control that is that you have two side panels that you can raise up and also there's a um, exhaust fan in there as well, okay? These are our new urban practices that we have. Uh, I didn't put them, all down, I, I, I kind of put these down 
uh, to the point that based upon the things that I've been hearing from a customer base here in uh, Jefferson County. So one of the new ones uh, that we have added on to it, it is the composting facility. The composting facility, I'm just going to read, I'm going to be verbatim on this, but uh, make it quick. It said the composting facility is installed on a small urban or organic farm to address water quality concerns, pests, rodents, concerns, and diseases. Vectors resulting from improper vegetative waste disposal by providing a dedicated facility for storage and treatment and by creating a compost product that can be used in multiple ways, uh, including land application enrichment of uh, crop ground. So that's a pretty way of saying, a uh, good way of saying a composting facility. Just get your dirt, rotate it, mouse, clean up, uh, counter you want to present, prevent, uh, if you got waste somewhere, put it to another area, then there's also beans that you can do rotation or whatnot. They kind of generate healthy soils for the crop. Uh, we also have runoff structures, uh, roof runoff structures, and I think this is for the high tunnel, uh, not to be used where contaminated soils exist and urban agricultural producers wish you to ad address a resource concern such as need for water or erosion around high tunnel uh, from roof runoff and collect and store roof runoff. So that's a pretty good one. Uh, I think that one could be kind of like it it sounds like a rain barrel a little bit, but like I say, these are, they just hit the fan. So, uh, you know, we're still working around them. Uh, there's gonna be more clarity to come. And also we have the storm water, uh, storm water collection. That's a thir uh, 36 by 30 area, four to eight feet deep, additional consideration for practice. Those would be addressed for practices, stormwater control. So in those situations right there, I don't want to necessarily say in a flooding area, these are not particularly designed. Uh, I'd be conservative on this one, not designed to necessarily control necessarily flooding, but in those areas where you have runoff, you know, it's not anything per se that's going to fix the whole community, but particular on your parcel, if you see uh, that you're having some runoff issues, that's a structure that we can, uh, that we can get implemented. Then we have an irrigation reservoir, right? A uh, plastic tank that goes up to a thousand gallons that you can use water, polyethylene plastic enclosed tank installed of a uh, well compacted drain, uh, six to four inch thick reinforced uh, concrete support pad, store water from reliable sources for irrigation, areas less than one acre, okay? So like I said, we're going back to small areas less than an acre, and just keep in mind, all these practices sound like a great idea, and they are great ideas, and they are very conservation-minded, but, you know, we have to come out there, do a field visit, site visit, to make sure that these practices are um, something that can help you, okay? So that's just a very brief uh, intro to just uh, our urban agriculture um, initiative that we have going, and you can see right here, it said, join us at Fountain Family Farm on June the 16th for an in-person farm tour in Birmingham. Registration will be live uh, this, this week. So I'm gonna go in more depth. We're gonna go in more depth with those programs then. I'm gonna showcase them all, uh, break it down, tell you the specs to them, how it works, uh, land suitability. We're just gonna go through the whole, um, the whole thing uh, as it relates with the high tunnel and also other things that you can do in um, urban ag. And also, we're going to go over some of the traditional things as well uh, at Mr. Fountain's place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Thank you as well, Holly and Gina. It was that that was a great presentation, awesome presentation. And um, I don't have them looking on Facebook. We don't have any questions right now. But what we're going to do is just going to have like a little short conversation and discuss more about these programs. And uh, what I like to do is start off uh, with uh, Ms. Gina concerning, um, concerning the USDA FSA programs. Um, Ms. Gina, I know you listed quite a few uh, programs. Um, and uh, can you let the audience know, we're not sure where our audience is from, but just let the audience know uh, those programs that you, that you listed, they are located, where they are located. She's still on. She had to hop off really quick. Sorry okay. about that, Alicia. But, no, um, no problem. No problem. Those are for, they can contact her directly if they have like 
specific questions about it. We'll try to get that handled. Hold on. Let me go back up. If somebody have questions for her, let me go to that. Okay. Okay. If you can go to her slide. We're going to show the slide. If that's okay, they can contact That'll be her. good. And, and let me say this while, we, uh, while you got her slide up. For uh, those individuals that are not in the state of Alabama, uh, a lot of those programs that she discussed are listed throughout the United States. So if you're uh, not located in Alabama, please contact your local farm service agency office. Let me say. And uh, you, if you notice, uh, for our audience, you notice that we have a lot of acronyms. It has quite a few acronyms. So FSA means Farm Service Agency. So definitely contact their office locally uh, uh, in your area if you have any questions about the microloans and any other programs listed. And so now, Mr. Uh, Curry, I know you talked about the five steps assistance process. And uh, can you give a little the audience a little bit more detail on how long the process takes? Uh, I have worked with quite a few farmers and sometimes people feel like it can happen overnight. And I'll say this, it rarely happens over, yeah, overnight. Yeah, yeah. So let us, so, let's us let let's put that disclaimer on that now for a lot of farmers that uh, kind of, uh, I, I, I meet a lot of farmers that come in my office and they're super excited. They're like, yeah, I'm gonna mm -hmm. do, this, do this. And I'm like, yeah. But it's a process. Yeah, yes. process. So, Mr. Curry, can you tell us more about that process? Yes, for sure. I could just, I could make it simple. you at least a year. Minimum, most of the time. Unless you have something like we have, kind of have one right now. If you have like a special uh, initiative or something like that, it can be, you know, two months. It can be a month, three months. But on average, you're looking at a year. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stay there a little bit with that year. Yes. If you are new, or even if you never worked with us, most of the time that year is actually good because uh, as I kind of stated earlier, you know, this is cost sharing. We just don't give you the money like that. You, you know, it's, it's a process. You need to get, you know, you need to educate yourself in the terms of, you know, where are you going to get the material? Uh, you know, working with contractors, you need to find out who's going to do it. If you're going to do it yourself, uh, do you agree uh, with our standards and specifications? So yeah, just just the year. Sometimes for some folks they're they're really in a hurry, but I find out that most folks who are always in a hurry, uh, you know, accidents are prone to happen. You know, or they 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 they'll miss some. So give yourself that year. You know, maybe eight months uh, time to kind of educate yourself and really find out more about uh, what you're doing. So, but yeah, straightforward. Is I say conservatively, uh, one year for sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Curry. I just wanted to make sure I say that because I know, um, like I said, a lot of um, farmers and new beginning farmers, particularly, come in my office and thinking it's going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. and let them know it is a process. It is a process, you guys, and we we uh, we just excited as you, and and so is uh, USDA. Uh, USDA offices, they're just as excited as you, but it is a process and we want to make sure you're aware of that process. That's right. Another thing I just kind of want to bring up, um, uh, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you don't agree to the contract that you're signing, you actually can just turn down the hoop house. Is that correct? Say, say that one more time. If you're not, if you don't, if you don't really care for the contract, it's not getting to you on time, or whatever the case may be, you're not locked in the country contract. You can actually say, I don't want the hoop house. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like that approach. Uh, but you can, it's called a council contract. And don't see that it goes back to that year again, right? You, right. you didn't had you didn't had six months, eight months, a whole year and things. Hold on. I mean, disclaimer on that one. Let me just, Pause parenthetically. Things does come up, you know. Yes. So upon situation like that, if if, if it's economics, um, you know, if there's a resource concern, I'm coming right from the modification checklist. Make sure that I'm following the policy. Uh, so yeah, if if it for those purposes and reasons, you can. But mm -hmm. if if it's just all of a sudden, uh, you know, you got you got excited. It's kind of stated earlier. Said so I want to see the high tone, and you come, you know. That's not what we like to see, though. Yeah, but you, it's, there's ways to get out of it. Yes, ma'am. 
Yes. And, and and that goes back to, I think, uh, even with having that line of discussion of the counseling and having a good rapport with your office or NRC mm -hmm. office to let them know that maybe you're having some financial difficulties right now. Maybe it's just not a, um, maybe there's death in a the family. They're uh, always use the example, life happens. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, some things are just unexpected, but you want to make sure you build a rapport with these offices. And I would even also say you want to make sure you know your land uh, right. and there and you are very familiar with your land. Mr. Curry, tell us some examples of how you actually had to uh, like walk through the land and like choose the site, like the process, even with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I uh, for my just for the field office, I created a, um, uh, a belt. What is that thing called? Bess Bessemer. Jefferson County, Birmingham accountability checklist, right? So it's about five or six questions on there. Um, to your point, land suitability. Uh, you know, um, I've went out to sites and they said they wanted to season the hot tunnel and it looked like they had a car lot out there. That's, we, you know, you can't mm, do that. One. Yes. Uh, yeah, mm. so as a, as a level of seriousness, you know, yeah, so, Having that having that relationship, that's important. But that checklist, which comes from, you know, a lot of things in the past. Do you understand? I ask questions like, do you understand cost sharing? And that may be number one. Yes. You know, do you understand how that works? Because a lot of people, Ms. Shaverist, uh, mm -hmm. when they come in the office, uh, they think it's like, okay, they're going to pay for the whole thing. And we, we pause there on cost. And there, you know, there are some, there are some cases that folks that say if we give hypothetically $10,000 for uh, a high tone. And this goes to mm -hmm. the next question, actually, that's on the accountability checklist. Have you reached out to a vendor? Okay. Uh, if you reached out to a vendor, you, and if I, if I give you a, um, the sheet that has the, the estimate on there, you know, that I'm going to pay $9,998 USDA uh, gonna, is going to pay that NRCS. Uh, and you're getting quotes for, uh, $13,000, $11,000, you know, you got to come to the, you know, you got to bring possibility, bring it, bring the other part to it. You know, there are some days I get, I get quotes two, three different days and, and, and somebody will say, okay, I got to quote the same exact one for 8,000 or $7,500. So I may be going stretching out a little far. So when you're working with, uh, those vendors, mm -hmm. You know, make sure that you're getting, make sure, you know, it's, I, I tell people to challenge it a little bit, you know, try not, no, don't be rude, but just challenge it to make sure, okay, you know, uh, don't tell people right off that you're working with NRCS. Give them mm -hmm. our standards and specifications. If it, if it matches that, you got the standard spec. You don't have to say, I'm working with the NRCS program, USDA, because sometimes I, I believe that that can, they can self-inflate, uh, some things, you know, that's just yes, what I yes. see. Cause I get the same people who talk differently and I have them oftentimes send me a, a, uh, a quote. I want to know what the quote is or whatnot and making sure that they're, that we're on uh, task to get things done. Uh, also get a soil test. So just when you call your local field office, each County, uh, you know, they do things a little bit different, but those are just <laughs> a few things, you know, uh, you know, just, just study, do your homework. I, I, I'm sorry. I thought I didn't put it on here. But there's a link that you can go in, USDA, you Google, you, anybody can Google this, USDA, Georgia, USDA, Alabama, USDA, Mississippi, and you can pull up so much information uh, online and, 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 and be self-study, know what's going on, you know, because most of the time when you go into a field office, uh, you know, you got people who are willing to help you, um, but you know- Listen. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And I was going to say, let's, yeah, we can be transparent okay. with that. Let, uh, I want our audience to know every office out there under USDA or don't have the same energy to help a lot of farmers. So you kind of have to go in doing your homework and actually, and I'd even say even building a rapport, uh, working with Alabama and Small Farms Research Center with extension we'll give you tips on how to negotiate we'll give you tips on who you need to contact we even tell you the right questions to ask when to ask so it mm -hmm. helps 
to kind of all, all go in already fully packed and fully loaded. So when you sit down with NRCS, it's more or less uh, y'all having a discussion how to move forward, not telling you how it's going to, how you going to move forward. And I think that's what a lot of farmers miss, may miss the understanding with uh, a lot of USDA offices. They're, ter- they're there to give you a program. They're not going to tell you all the time which one worked better and go through all the details. They're going to give you a program. So I can say I've seen that quite often. And, uh, but I, working with Mr. Curry and the Jefferson County and even I'm here in Huntsville in the Madison County office, they have been exceptional working with our farmers. But let me give a disclosure, just because they have been exceptional doesn't mean that you're going to get that same kind of service and same kind of energy everywhere. So we kind of give all out what our farmers that disclosure and kind of prep them for what to expect in some of these offices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did I hit the mark on that one, Mr. Curry? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. And going back to uh, when you were discussing, like uh, there, uh, and I think, I think the word call share is um, some people truly don't understand the word call share and mm-hmm. break it down a little more in layman's terms. Okay. We don't. We don't. We. Huh? What you say, Mr. Curry? Okay. Basically, USDA gonna pay a certain amount, and you gonna pay the difference. Bingo. Correct. Is that that's that's, that's a good way of looking at it. And if you surplus on some things, if you surplus on some things, or it's a, if it happens to be a plus, it happens to, to be a plus. But don't come don't plus. come in with the mindset. Uh, you know, especially like I said, if it's an investment and it's something you really want to make your farm uh, better, you know, come in with the mindset you going to put some you going to we hear we sharing the cost with you. That's, yes. that's it. You know, we're we gonna share. So think about sharing. Yeah. We bridging the gap on our resources. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Basically, that's what we're doing. We bridging the gap on our resources. And I was just thinking too, when you were discussing when you said some uh you had uh, listed all the projects uh, that uh, you offer and you were saying how you actually work, you can actually work with other grant programs. The one I think about, first of all, is RCND. They have quite a few grant programs. So definitely, I can suggest everybody do your homework. It helps. It helps to leverage these programs on your property to get the best, the best um, um, resources and opportunities for your operation. Yeah, I can say that. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree with you on that one. I agree with you on that. Utilize your resources because oftentimes, and just keep in mind, uh, you know, conservation district, RCND, all those, you know, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you know, the colloquialism, you know, closed mouth doesn't get fed, you know. Yeah. So when you, when you open up and you ask those questions, you know, that's where it starts, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, not, you know, just going to many sources, you know, I think yes. it's, it's always good. And, and also, uh, Holly, she put this on here. Uh, you can check that. Uh, I think that's actually hyperlink. Yeah. You can hit that. Thank you for putting that on there. Huh? This NRCS site. Mm-hmm. Alabama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then you got Jefferson County Conservation District. So you can check a lot of that stuff out. That's a right. that's a source. That's a source for you. And um, Mr. Curry, for this mm-hmm. agriculture initiative, who actually can apply? Tell us more details. Is it just for farmers? Is it just for new and beginning farmers? Is it uh, can who can apply? Uh, the doors is open. Uh, so pretty okay. much from all of the above. OK, uh, you know, if, if you are if you are a, a landowner, um, you know, in Jefferson County and if you are producing vegetation, uh, you're working with uh, uh, organizations of growing things. And if you have that land suitability, we'll walk through the, the eligibility. You know, we we'll go through the, just the base. It starts with a phone call, you know, okay. uh, but just if, if you're growing something. And if you got 600 square feet, 700 square feet, or whatever uh, the size that was stated on the uh, PowerPoint, 600 square feet to 2178, you know, of course, you don't want to just make it that tight. But if you have a uh, small acre of land, I think, you know, that's a great possibility, uh, you know, that we with NRCS, especially with this urban ag initiative, there, mm-hmm. that, there's, there are some things on there that's listed in those practices that can assist just about, I say just about 
uh, any landowner, uh, she or he, who has the mindset, a conservation mindset, and want to, you know, produce fruits and veggies, or wildlife opportunities, it's, it's a plethora of things, you know, so yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's open to the public. Yeah, let me say this, and mm -hmm. say everyone, we talking about churches, we talking we talk about for profit, we profit, talking about non-profit organizations, we talking about agribusinesses, let me get down to the grid, we talking about cooperatives, new and beginning farmers, socially mm -hmm. managed farmers, limited yep. resource farmers, so pretty much uh, it's open to everyone that's interested in growing. Yeah, let, let me put it, let me, let me back it up. Let me, let me back it up a little bit. So private okay. land, private land owners and nonprofits, but uh, most things like if a school would apply for it, per se, the school wouldn't be able to do it. But if the school have a, what foundation? A local nonprofit, a local nonprofit they can do that. Say, say for instance, you may have, uh, Miles College, actually Miles themselves, if I'm not mistaken, have to take policy on it. I, I'm thinking, I think I'm, I'm right. Um, but if they have a church that's associated with Miles as a nonprofit, they can do it that way. So there's ways, there's ways uh, around it to make sure that it's right. Right, and I think that goes back to what you just said. Come and visit you. Come and see. Yeah. You. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma you. <laughs> it goes right. back to uh, what um. I guess you guys, what you're going to hear me talking about throughout, if you look at all my presentations and all our outreach programs, we keep talking about building a rapport with these USDA offices, building a rapport, building a conversation, discussion, what you're trying to do. Actually, um, so there are so many um, options out there, but actually giving that um, person more lines of who you are, what your farm is about, but going back building a rapport network yes that helps too yes that does it does, it does. and um it does. awesome awesome so I, i'm looking forward to uh is it uh i know we're talking about jefferson county but i think when we go back to the map saying this is a uh, program is offered throughout the state of alabama and mm -hmm. these are the locations so yes yep so it's all right there and i would highly encourage you to reach out to that field office, uh, the DC, the Soil Con Technician Conservation District. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. there's opportunities. And I noticed that the deadline is May the 13th. Is that solidified? Or? May, yeah, May the 11th. I'm sorry, May the 11th is the deadline. May the 11th. Okay. So keep in mind, please feel free to share, like, and forward this information. If you know, um, individuals, nonprofit foundations that are in these areas and they kind of been thinking about a hoop house or just kind of wanting to know more information. This is a perfect uh, urban initiative to get that ball rolling and get the conversation mm -hmm. started. Get the conversation That's right. started. That's right. Now I got one question. Um, do you consider, um, will you take questions for people that are in other counties? Uh, can you kind of I ain't gonna tell uh, we're not telling you to guide them, but just if they have a few questions, can they call your office first before they or even if they wanted to know where their office is located, can they contact you guys? Yeah, if they call and want to know about the other office offices, sure. Uh, okay. I oftentimes get questions, uh get you know, you know, I, I've I've had conversations, but I'm gonna say this. Uh it's the importance of Working with your, your, get that relationship with that, uh, that district conservationist, you know. Yeah. Uh, so speaking yeah. from a, a district conservationist standpoint, uh, you know, if I was outreach coordinator, you know, something like that, maybe perhaps I could go in more depth, but I try, I try to, give, I, I give people the basics. I get calls from uh, uh, up north, up uh, some parts of uh, the different counties up north. I've had areas called from the Black Belt. Uh, on several occasions, I, I give them if they they really want, I give them the basics of the NRCS, but I yes. always get them to their to their local field office because that's that it's it's important to establish that relationship with the district conservation. And, and if, the if I would just have to say a little word, it's just just think conservation mind. You know, think mm -hmm. soils, think about the problem that you have, and and and, and if there's a problem or area to improve, I think that that's, that that district conservation is going to be willing to work with. 
that field office is going to be willing to work with. And let me say so this, if, if you listen to me, farmers, and listen well, if you're an organization, if you're having trouble uh, with uh, some of these offices, at the end of the day, you still have to work with them. You can't go to another county um, where the land is not located and work with that second county. You actually have to work with your local offices. So if you're having little difficulties and little, um, we call them situationships, definitely kind of contact us and reach out to us. And we can definitely be a mediator in the process. We can definitely be a mediator. But going back to what we kind of been pushing and uh, saying throughout this presentation, building that rapport and actually working with these offices closely. Yeah. And Alicia, just to add to your point of that, the if you are having issues like the district, your local district board, that's a great resource for you to to communicate yeah. with them. That you know part of why we're there is to help bridge that gap. So if you're having a little challenging situation, reach out to that district conservation. Um, I'm sorry, the district mm -hmm. um, administrative coordinator or your district board in that county. You know, get that relationship going too. Oh, that's good. Oh, the, power, the power of the partnerships. Work with everybody. Yeah. Work for everybody. Yes, yes. All right, you guys. Let me uh um do we have any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself. I see we have a few farmers online. Please feel free to unmute, uh, unmute yourself if you have any questions. If you uncomfortable uh speaking, uh this uh this outreach program is being recorded. So if you have if you're uncomfortable speaking, you definitely can use the chat box. Please feel free to use the chat box. We'll make sure we address your questions. We actually are coming to a close. Um, I, I kind of, I like to give a recap and kind of just always say every time I listen to our USDA presentations, I learn a lot and I learn much, much more to give to my farmers here at Alabama a and University Small Farms Research Center. But one of the things I can say, the bottom line that I have once again taken away from this presentation is visit your local USDA offices. Uh, find out where they are, visit them before you even need, the, uh, need a program actually. So you'll have a uh, you'll start building a report early versus uh, sometimes you uh, wait till a program is offered and then you uh, uh, you're rushed you're feeling that tension of life so and you think the process is supposed to be rushed too and like we've been saying with, throughout this presentation all these programs nothing happens overnight right. at least a month at least two months. Um, Mr. Carey said up to a year. So um, please note that uh, visit your local, visit your local USDA office just to, just to see what they going on, have going on. Start building that report now. Next one I would suggest is do your homework. <laughs> and sometimes that's a little hard. You kind of want to avoid that tough task and you kind of want to put it in the lap of USDA. Yeah. <laughs> willing to help and sometimes it actually helps to actually come in with a plan so they're working toward a plan versus working toward figuring out what you're trying to do or, or what you haven't done so kind of do your homework as a farmer and become at one and more familiar with your land and uh once you do that 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 helps the uh when the mr curry come out or one of these uh uh, NRCS people come out, district uh, conservationists, they can actually say, oh, this is what, you can actually have a meaningful conversation how to move forward and how to make your uh, farmland more sustainable. And the last one I suggest, uh, you know I'm going to plug us in. Touch bases with Alabama and those small farms research center. There you go, there you go. Yeah, touch bases with us, touch bases with your local Alabama Crawford Extension System. And let me give you some reasons why. You touching bases with us, we're familiar with some of these programs. We work closely with all these USDA offices. We are here to help you navigate the process, mediate these process to provide guidance, to provide assistance. All the um, decisions are up to you, but we wanna make sure you get the full picture 
uh, before you make those tough life-changing decisions, and we want to make sure the right people are in the network, the right people are sitting at the table and helping you, uh, the specialists, the scientists, the economists, the microbiologists, the uh, district conservationists, all these people are at the table to actually help you guide you through the process. So definitely reach out to us. And uh, I, I wanna give a special shout out to Mr. Curry. Thank you so much for the presentation. Very, very informative. And thank you so much, Holly, for everything. Um, Holly has been very instrumental for us to get this going and kind of been staying on me and Mr. Curry to make sure it's uh, at the forefront in a timely manner. So deadline, May the 11th, Mr. Curry, Holly, I'm gonna let you all have the last word. The floor is yours, ma'am and sir. Ladies first. Just, um... Uh, just again, just in, if you if you're wanting more information about anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us, um, email, call, visit our websites, um, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Curry. Yeah, my my closing remarks is just uh, step out. You know, <laughs> if 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 it's something that you think you have uh, interest in doing, or even if you've worked with the NRCS uh, before. Uh, don't be afraid to be a repeat customer, you know, because, you know, getting conservation on the ground is something that we need uh, throughout the states. We need throughout the whole uh, the total United States. So if you're in Georgia, if you're in Mississippi, Alabama, of course, the great state of Alabama, wherever, uh, just step out, go to your conservation, uh, um, NRCS, uh, SWCD office, and uh, don't be afraid to have those conversations, ask those questions. And uh, don't look at a no as uh, something bad. Look at no as the uh, next option, you know? So you hear no, uh, ask question, what, 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 what can I do to grade, get a good conservation um, plan on this particular parcel? So just ask those questions, and do your research. Uh, you know, that's, that's my close remark. And one other thing on here that was uh, not right, we put Pike County on there. Thank you, Mr. McCray. Is actually Houston, mm -hmm. not yeah. Pike. It's Houston. So I'll just make Sorry sure. I say. That. Yeah, no, 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 no big. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's it. That's my closing remarks. If you got any questions? Uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to Holly or myself, or Ms. Savers, uh, Gina, or whoever. We work together. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you all will register if you're in the Birmingham area. I hope you all register for our event that's going to be Thursday, June the 16th. We're going to be working with, it's going to be a forum tour. Actually, you're going to see hands on these programs. So I'm looking forward to that. You're going to, if you had never seen a hoop house, you're going to see a hoop house. You're going to see all those practices put to use as well as get a chance to visit a family farm and learn a, uh, a lot about his rich history and his farm operation and what he's doing. And, and you know, like I said, some st sustainable agriculture practices. So definitely make sure you register for that program. And I hope you stay tuned to our next program. We'll have a series of these Zoom meetings. So definitely join us on, um, uh, if you haven't registered and looked at our Facebook page, Small Farms Research Center, AAMU. And until next time, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.